Well, hello and welcome to Change in the Weather, a climate communication workshop. I'm Luke Swetland, President and CEO of the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History and Sea Center. So why are we here tonight? Well, one of the three priorities in our institutional strategic plan is for the museum to continually strive to be the best science communicator it possibly can be. Now, a major part of that commitment is to provide a space to have important and often challenging conversations about what it means and what it takes to be better stewards of our community and of our environment. In our past town halls and in workshops, such as this one today, we convene experts to join that conversation so that we can learn from them and so that we can build our collective will and confidence to turn authentic conversation into informed action. The museum is delighted to be co-organizing this event with the Community Environmental Council and Climate Central. Many of you who are joining us local, locally know the good work of the CEC. Since 1970, CEC has innovated and incubated real life environmental solutions that directly affect the Central California coast. Their current work advances rapid and equitable solutions to the climate crisis, including ambitious zero carbon goals, the drawdown of excess carbon and protection against the impacts of climate change. CEC is an ongoing strategic partner of the museum. Climate Central is a new partner to us and I wanna thank CEC for introducing us to them. Climate Central is an independent nonprofit whose mission is to empower compelling communication on climate change impacts and solutions. Using science, their media savvy and technology, Climate Central produces localized content that can then be scaled up nationally, thereby helping trusted voices of science reach diverse national audiences. I wanna be sure and thank the museum's Crystal Bianchi Fund for its generous financial support that makes today's program possible. Throughout this program, we welcome your questions and comments at any time. Please use the chat or the Q&A box that you'll find at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to those questions at the end of the program. I really wanna thank Iris Kelly of CEC. She's running our tech and our slides behind the scene. So if you hear us mention her name, it's because we're shouting out for her to help us figure out what to do next. So thank you, Iris. So let me run through the program. We're gonna start with Dr. Lisa Lembruni from UC Santa Barbara. She's gonna set up the conversation by talking about the structure of what we call the climate story concept. Then we're gonna to turn to chief meteorologist Bernadette Woods Plackey from Climate Central. She's gonna discuss how they take that concept and make climate information accessible and relevant to audiences. Then we'll hear from Anthony Yanez from NBC Los Angeles. He's their chief meteorologist, and he's gonna share examples of how he incorporates climate storytelling into his weather broadcasts. Then to wrap it all up, Sigrid Wright, CEO of the Community Environmental Council, will lead a discussion with the speakers about actionable skills all of us can incorporate into our daily lives to encourage positive climate conversations. We have a lot to cover, so let me get started. Dr. Lisa Lambruni is the Environmental Communication Program Director and a lecturer for the Strategic Environmental Communication and Media Program at UCSB's Bren School of Environmental science and management. Previously, Lisa worked for NOVA, WGBH Boston. There she co-developed proposals for new television programs. She oversaw media evaluation and impact studies, and she conducted extensive editorial research. We are so glad that Lisa could join us this evening to get us started. 
And so with that, I'm turning it over to you, Dr. Limbruni. Wonderful. Thank you, Luke. I appreciate the introduction and great introduction to the panel overall. I'm so pleased to be here um, and excited to be talking with this great panel. Tonight is such an incredibly important discussion. Um, I'm so impressed to see that over 100 of you have shown up today to find ways to talk about climate and to think about it and sort of bring it into your conversations because that's really what we need. Um, so I do this a lot. I think about this at the Bren School quite a bit. Um, and this is really an incredibly important discussion because as we know, the impacts of climate change are intensifying. And at the moment, we don't quite have enough policy and corporations on board doing the things that we need to. So we can all take on a lot of this burden and, and feel like, what, what could we possibly do? Maybe I'm already biking, I'm trying to save energy and water. There's so much to do. And then of course, on top of that, climate change has become so polarized and linked in a sense to identities, to moral stances, it becomes conflated to something much larger than the science itself. And on top of that, with so much out in the media these days, science becomes, in effect, just another opinion, just another attitude. It, there's really nothing that people lose by choosing not to pay attention to it if it's not impacting them in the moment. So it becomes a choice with really no repercussion. Uh, well, we, we can argue that, of course, but right to the person in the moment for choosing not to engage with it. So how do we actually skirt around these issues of identity and moral stance and politics? It's so hard. We don't want to fall into that hole. We want to really stay aligned with the science and with the impact and how we can get people moving in that direction. So what are some of the other challenges? I'm just going to go through a couple, which I'm sure you already know, but then we'll move into what we can do about them. So, you know, Historically, climate science is so challenging. It's complex, multidisciplinary, multifaceted, so much with regard to modeling. So it can be a huge burden when we feel like we need to understand all of that to make a difference. That's putting a lot on ourselves. And there's ways that we can talk about it without having to be responsible for understanding all of the modeling scenarios. So that's important to keep in mind. It's not necessary to take all of that on. Um, the other is, well, climate is something that has slow shifting baselines and people maybe can't see over time what has changed, right? Historically, things used to be a certain way. There used to be these populations of birds or insects. We don't see that anymore. But unfortunately, things are changing so quickly that more people have that immediate um, impact. They understand how things are different, maybe from when they were younger to where they are now. So that's another inroad, right? That we can talk a little bit more about once we get into the weather. Also with regard to things being remote, right? Climate can feel like it's something that's happening so far away at the poles, it's impacting other people. But now, unfortunately, with these ongoing wildfire seasons, when we also have deep freezes in Texas and other severe weather events and the like, this becomes a way to sort of pick up the conversation as these unfolding events are happening so that you have a prompt and an inroad at any moment. So some of these historic challenges, unfortunately, are becoming easier to talk about simply because climate change is intensifying so much, but we can take that then as part of our responsibility to talk about it. Um, so that really leads us nicely to weather, right? It's a great way to, everybody talks about the weather. <laughs> so um, really the one thing that I wanted to leave you all with before I hand it over to Bernadette is basically what I would say is arguably one of the most important things that you can do right now for the climate is to start the conversation. So what do I mean by that? Well, in my own research on climate communication habits, individuals who believed that climate change was happening were far more likely to discuss climate change only within their own social units. So they reported talking about it, they talked about it a lot, but they only sought out people who agreed with them and they had these like wonderful conversations. But for those people who didn't agree that climate change was happening, they denied it, they reported talking about it more overall with those who disagreed with them so that they were actually seeking that type of engagement. So in a sense, uh, deniers were not afraid to start the conversation. So I say, you shouldn't be either. You shouldn't be afraid to start those conversations. 
So once again, I just want to encourage you to get out of your comfort zone and actually try talking about it, even if you're not entirely sure of the exact right things to say, but you're going to be getting a ton of ideas tonight. Um, you just have to be bold. You have to experiment and just start that conversation. Okay, so with that, I'm pleased to hand the discussion over to Bernadette Woods Plackey. She is the Chief Meteorologist and Climate Matters Program Director for Climate Central, an independent nonprofit group of scientists and communicators who research and communicate climate science. Their Climate Matters program provides data and graphics to a network of over 970 TV meteorologists, nearly half of all meteorologists in the United States. So here you go, Bernadette. Thank you, Lisa. And so, yes, everybody, I am Bernadette working at Climate Central, and we're going to get into a little more of an example of everything that Lisa laid out in some of the challenges in communicating climate change, one of the ways that Climate Central has applied those in a successful program. So just bear with me while I share my screen here and bring up some slides that we're going to talk through, but it's continuing this conversation of the climate conversation that Lisa teed up and this case study of Climate Matters. So weather. It is one of the primary ways that people experience climate change. Extreme weather when it slaps you in the face and it forces you to rethink lifestyles and, and things that you're engaged in. And even in the slow ways that the climate is changing over time and it's changing everything around us that impacts our health, our ways of life. And we'll get into all of that in a moment, but weather is in your face on how the climate is changing. And so we started this program with a bunch of different friends. It wasn't just Climate Center, it was also George Mason University, NASA, NOAA, Yale, but not just engaging in the weather aspect of it, but the people on the front lines of talking about weather, TV meteorologists. They are in a really unique position. They're trusted messengers. For the most part, TV meteorologists are scientists and they are skilled communicators. They take these really complex equations of what's going on in our atmosphere and tell you if it's gonna rain or how the winds are going to interact with the oceans. And so they already have this ability to break down these big concepts into simple messages. Also, they have a dedicated audience. You know, when something's going on, you turn on your local weather to figure out what's going on. Even if there was a little off on a forecast, which is very rare, you come back to them. So it's a dedicated audience that you keep coming back to. And they are on the front lines of what's going on. They have an ability to connect the changes that you're experiencing. And when we started this project, it was about 10 years ago with one meteorologist in Columbia, South Carolina. And this was a quote from his news director. She said, our audience can feel what's going on. It's happening right outside. Now we can help them understand it. That's what we're supposed to do, inform our community. That's what news is about, making those connections, helping people understand what's going on and what can be done about that. So Mary Beth was not afraid to jump into this project. And so that was with one TV meteorologist, as we said, in 2010. Since then, we have grown considerably. And as Lisa so nicely put it, this is about half of the TV meteorologists that are in the United States. And we're also expanding all of our work with 56 Spanish language meteorologists, not quite as many Span Spanish language stations in the United States, but we're making some good inroads there too. And it's really to work with this growing network to see engagement and climate messaging grow across the board. So here are some of the climate broadcasts. In the beginning of this project, got a couple of them out here and there, and our network was small. But you see over time, those messages have grown. Not quite the same growth last year, but as we all know, there are a lot of challenges going on in the world and media and everyone. And so it still did grow, even with those challenges of COVID. And our own lives of having, as you'll see from Anthony in a moment, who I'm gonna hand this over to next, having been forced to work at home, even from a TV station, which has never happened before, we still saw a growth in climate messaging because this is such a critical issue that affects all of us. Now, so how do we do this, right? We focus on the science first and foremost. Climate Central is not an advocacy organization. We are really grounded and our moral compass is the science, but we translate that science. We localize data whenever possible. You know, it's a global issue, but you feel it locally and personally. We operate on a news cycle. So even though we dive into research, we're going to release that research when it makes sense with what's going on in the world. For example, we are not going to do a ton of extreme heat 
in the middle of winter when we're dealing with people across the country. So it's really news relevant in the time to connect with what's going on in the world. We make it simple and compelling. We do that translation and we produce content weekly, both in English and in Spanish and offer trainings and ongoing support to our network. So it's this weekly package of material that we put out and story ideas, but also we do workshops and webinars and help advance the knowledge and understanding of the subject matter. Here's a sampling of some of the type of content that we would put out. And I've really focused this on the West Coast. I know we have some people joining us from everywhere, but the prime the primary audience here has been West Coast focused. So you're going to see some of these graphics relevant to the West Coast. You know, those hotter years, we are seeing a higher wildfire risk. We're seeing larger, more explosive wildfires. A lot of that connected with the Western drought, which this year is another big story. And that goes hand in hand with the diminishing snowpack, which feeds our water resources. This is costing us money. Billion dollar disasters. I mean, think about that billion with a B to that level are just off the charts. Used to average a few of those a year. Last year, 22 of those across the country. We're seeing weather related power outages on the rise. And this slow grind in changing weather doesn't just hit us in these extreme events, but it's worsening our air quality. It's also putting an increase on the spread of disease spreading mosquitoes and other sorts of insects. It's hitting our ways of life, football, skiing, our sports, and some of our favorite beverages from beer to wine to coffee. Those key ingredients are all being affected by climate change. So this is really all around us. And so this is how we've packaged this product to work with these trusted messengers and it is working. So here's a snapshot. This was during the last release of the National Climate Assessment when Obama was president. And you know who he invited to the White House? TV meteorologists. Those were the only one-on-one -on -one interviews that he granted. TV meteorologists to get this information out. And during the course of this project, actually, it, it's grown pretty considerably. In 2010, only 54% of TV meteorologists were even convinced the climate was changing. Those numbers have grown to well over 95% right now. So we've, we've really advanced this. And you see it in their messaging. It's not just making a simple connection, but this network is rocking it. They are taking it to a whole new level. These innovative stories, these entire series that they're packaging together in the top right hand corner here. This is Heather in Buffalo. She does these really fun, snappy climate minutes. You've got Ariel in Miami. He's got a whole series going and he goes out on boats, as you can see, and he's really jumping into the stories of this. We've got Jacob, he's in Western Massachusetts. He's got a regular series that he's actually also called Climate Matters. We've got Miami on the bottom right here. We've got DC on the bottom left, all regular series they've incorporated. Some of you who may watch CBS might not wanna say that. We've got Anthony coming off from NBC, but if you watch CBS, Jeff Berdelli is part of this network and he actually helped inspire this new position at the network at CBS to have a climate correspondent. And this whole network has really collectively raised their voice at times. Some of you may have seen these warming stripes. If you haven't, I'll explain. It's this really creative design by the scientist in England, Ed Hawkins. And each stripe, on this image represents a year of temperature anomalies. And that's the geeky way of saying the departure from average. So when you see a blue stripe, it's a cooler year. When you see a red stripe, it's a warmer year. And you can see in some of those snapshots, it goes from blue all the way over to red. That's our warming across the globe. So what happened was this group came together and said, you know what, we're sick of people questioning the science. So collectively, we're raising our voice on climate change and more these stripes and everyone in their own spaces really did their own sort of a broadcast and their own flair on this. And we're taking it to whole new levels. Weather is how we're powering society and that's gonna grow with wind and solar. So there's a weather power tool that a handful of our meteorologists from Phoenix, Arizona to Des Moines, Iowa and the Quad Cities. And we're looking at some of you in in California may recognize out of Fresno there, we've got AJ Fox and then Alex Garcia in San Antonio incorporating them to weather forecasts here. So what have we learned? And the reason I bring this together is because I think this applies to you in your regular life too and how you can engage in these conversations. Know your audience. You hear it all the time in communication. It is the golden rule, but there's a lot to unpack there. No topic tone, timing, how to engage in a conversation. 
meet people where they are. If it was purely information that was going to solve this issue, it'd be solved. We know a lot about this. But you have to connect with people on shared values to engage in those conversations. Simplify, drop the jargon, get to the basic levels of what's understanding, of what you understand or what could be understood. I get really frustrated when people say it's dumbing it down. No, it takes some serious skill to be able to explain this in a simplified way. Personalize, localize, tell a story. Bring it together into a personal shared experience. Don't be afraid because you have science on your side. And I want to share this last slide with you too is for social media engagement because this has come up in questioning a lot in the past. Where I engage in social media on this is where you feel like you can add value. Be true to yourself. It's easy to get caught in some of the conversations on the side there that can go in some bad ways. But be true to yourself and be kind. We lose a lot of that on social media. There's ways to engage in this conversation that are done in a kind way. So with that, what I'm going to do now is hand it over to my dear friend, Anthony Yanez, and he's going to show how this comes alive. So if you don't know Anthony, but I have a feeling many of you do, but some are joining us from outside California. He's chief meteorologist in LA, and he spent about 20 years in broadcasting. Initially, well, I should say before this, he was in Houston, and that's really where he found his love and his passion for weather. And since then, it's just taken it to a whole new level. And he has done a lot with the youth, and he's even a published author with some kids' books, too. So with that, Anthony, go ahead. Uh, thank you uh, so much, Bird. I appreciate the kind introduction. Um, I did. It's so funny. I've been called chief meteorologist twice on this call so far, and I'm not a chief meteorologist. I would love one day. I've been in the weather for 20 years, and I would love one day to be a chief, but I still do not have that title. What I would like to share with you is basically how I partnered with Burn and, and Climate Central and also worked on my own to really present climate stories on television in Los Angeles. And so I, I go out and report sometimes. You can see that's the Woolsey fire behind me. And then also I've talked about uh, the forecast for 2100, the extreme scenario for Long Beach, California. And so as we move forward in the slides, what I really wanna do is just kind of share my story with you uh, of where I am and how I get this information and how I put it, uh, put it forth. But I wanna start with, uh, Way back, I went to the University of New Mexico and I majored in journalism and mass communication. So I am not a climatologist. I am not a meteorologist when I started. I am now, I went back to school, but I started actually in journalism. And I really think that helped me once I became a meteorologist to be able to tell a better weather story, but it's really helped me now when I'm trying to tell climate stories. So let's go to the next slide now. Um, let's see, um, what most people think of meteorologists I, I think they, we go in front of a green screen, we put a bunch of numbers up like you're seeing here and uh, this next slide in, in Los Angeles, we have microclimates. And so we have a million seven day forecasts and I just get lost in these numbers. And it, so it's just become such a data dump. And so what I've tried to do is tell a story. And so it's not only just a Weller story, but it's also a climate story. So for the next slide, uh, what we have here, is the marine layer. So if you're watching this along the West Coast, you're very familiar with this. You're familiar with this if you're in Santa Barbara, uh, LA, San Diego. Um, we wake up with gray skies for a good three to four months out of the year. And I ran across a, a science publication that stated that the marine layer is shrinking, that we don't have as much of a marine layer as we used to have. And I was like, this is a great climate story. And so I'd like to share with you a part of that. I won't share all of it because I'll run out of time, but I just wanna give you an idea of some of the work I do here uh, at NBCLA. Here is uh, a disappearing. The marine layer, a staple of our summer weather here in Southern California. Yeah, it goes by many names. Did you know this here? May gray, June gloom, and my favorite this month, August. I like that. <laughs> that but one I didn't know. <laughs> but are these clouds suddenly disappearing? NBC4 meteorologist Anthony Yannis is here to help us clear up the fog. Anthony. Y yes, I'm here for you, and let's do that. Now, if you've lived here long enough, you know what it's like to go to bed with clear skies and wake up uh, with the skies looking like this in the morning. It can be a mild nuisance like this morning or can cut visibilities to almost zero, making for a difficult ride to work. But the marine layer also plays an important role with vegetation and fires, and that role is changing. 
On an open field in Santa Barbara, UCSB professors Dar Roberts and Mac Moritz check their weather station recording equipment. These instruments record temperatures, winds, humidity, and stratus clouds, or what we usually call them, the marine layer. Using similar weather stations in Santa Monica, Burbank, and Santa Ana, the pair made a startling discovery. Since 1970, our Southern California marine layer has decreased by 25 to 50 percent. Cloud bases have risen 150 to 300 feet, and the marine layer is clearing earlier in the day. And this has led to another finding. This is the first time we really have some evidence to say that cloud shading does impact the uh, timing of the start of the fire season. The problem with a shrinking marine layer. Okay, is we'll go ahead and stop there. The, the rest of the story really is, is about climate change and how climate is affecting the marine layer. So that was basically kind of the introduction and then it gets into the science of what climate change is doing. Now what I wanna share is kind of partnering with Burn uh, and Climate Central. Uh, I saw Mark Taylor asked a question. I'd like to get my local meteorologist involved in this. Is there a fee? No, this is free. All it takes is an email. You get an email list and you get these kind of graphics that are presented to you and it's easy. Uh, and again, because I'm a meteorologist but, uh, by study um, and not a climatologist, this helps me tremendously to be able to have everything, basically all of the information presented for you, and you can read the, the science and, and look at where everything is coming from. And she showed that uh, hotter years and you get more fires. And so all of this work, the, the, the really hard work is done for you, and you're just able to simply present this on TV as slides. And so go ahead. Um, and it, so it's just such a huge help. Uh, let's see, what's the next slide here? We have, of course, we have our, our Santa Ana fires. Again, as a meteorologist, we're using our satellite to show the, the, the smoke from the Thomas fire from Santa Ana winds. We'll move forward. We'll get through these kind of quickly because what I really want to show you is, you know, we use the technology of radar to show the smoke up to current temperatures, how dry it is, how windy it is and how it impacts families. And this is really where it hits home. But the number one question that I received more than anything else, when we're covering fires, especially over the last several years in Southern California, and you go to the next slide, is that, is this climate change? Is climate change causing these fires to burn more rapidly, to spread faster, that we have more of them? And here's just an introduction of a story because that question was asked so many times. I said, we've got to find the answer. And here is the, again, just the introduction of uh, 2018 fires brought devastating change. wildfires to our state, the largest and most destructive in California history. Many point to climate change as part of the problem, but are there other explanations as well? Meteorologist Anthony Anas is here now with a closer look for us. Anthony. Carolyn, it's a topic that can't be avoided. Is climate change to blame for how large and destructive our California wildfires are? The scientists who work daily with fire say the answer isn't a simple one. You can't avoid the images and scale. The two most destructive and two largest fires in California history have occurred in the past two years. November's campfire destroyed nearly 19,000 structures and the Mendocino complex and Thomas fires burned 750 million acres combined. Is this climate change? The things that we care about in fire are getting more severe during the fire season. So things like relative humidity, things like the number of days without rain, temperature, wind speed, all those things are, are getting more severe during the fire season in the Western United States. The simple answer is yes. A warmer climate leads to more evaporation. That leads to more drought, leading to more dead fuel, which leads to hotter temperatures, a vicious cycle. But when it comes to fires in California, okay, we can go ahead and stop there and we'll go move forward uh, because of time. Um, and so let's see, what's the next slide? Uh, Bernadette was showing this one. Uh, this is the solar panel and wind forecast. And I had a really difficult time because, again, I'm not a good numbers guy. I mean, it's funny for a meteorologist because too many numbers, like, how do I make this more simple? And so I basically made a bunch of phone calls from this information from Climate Central, and you can click the video and said, how can I basically show what solar energy is doing in Southern California? And then I put the solar panel forecast uh, and the wind forecast at the end of the story. So I use the numbers, but I explain the numbers by having this story. We can clip again, just the beginning of this, and this is pretty much 
at the end. Southern of California the averages 284 days of sunshine a year, but right now we're in the cloudy and rainy season. So this is a good time to show the effects of solar panels powering your home. If you've ever considered the move to solar power, you know you have to weigh the cost of installation to the expected savings over time. But a new program installs solar panels to communities most in need. It's a sunny morning in Linwood and this grid alternatives crew is doing an install. But these workers aren't your typical crew. Nyla Kusar and Spencer Jefferson are part of an on the job training program that provides vital skills in the solar industry. It's always good to come to a job with like some kind of like knowing. So I think me having and we can go ahead and stop and there. Uh, but basically the, the, the rest of the story is 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 about installing solar panels, these people who have solar panels, um, how it's working for them. And then I say, hey, it's raining, but here's how much energy they're actually getting and how much money they're saving by having the solar panels. And again, that comes from Climate Central. Um, I wanted to end with this. Uh, the future, um, good climate science is honestly, it's getting out. Uh, the bad thing that I see on social media, Bernadette was talking about this, is that the bad science is getting out too. I can't tell you how many times I've looked at an article and I'm like, wait, what? And then I look at where that article's from and I do not recognize where that site is. Um, but I found really for me, the message has to focus on adaptation and solutions. Um, the message of fear and put downs just honestly does not work. Telling people they're wrong, it just gets them more into their own corner. Um, but really this what this talks about is how do we come together and really be able to share uh, what we see, share the science, um, and sometimes disagree, but don't be disagreeable. Um, so that's that's my time. I did want to end by saying Irene Cook had a, a question about uh, what's NBC's network plan. Um, it's already in motion. They've made a big commitment to, hey, tell climate stories. Um, so you see Al Roker doing that all the time uh, on the Today Show. If you're in different markets, certain markets, you'll see your local meteorologists at NBC. Uh, we're all NBC on board and, and doing climate stories similar um, to what I shared with you. Okay, I would like to introduce uh, Singren Wright, the CEO of Community Environmental Council. She is going to moderate the rest of the evening. Thank you. Fantastic. That was so inspiring and illuminating. Lisa, Bernadette, Anthony, really appreciate that. And there's so many questions. I wanna um, invite folks to be putting questions in the Q&H there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we are screening those. We're going to try to answer a few um, online when we can, and then I'll try to move us along so we can answer a few here as well. Um, so lots of great questions here. I, I think I want to start with one um, that really about it's Alan's question about balancing accurate data with effective, clear, and digestible information, numbers, and visuals. So really, it's kind of to your point, Bernadette, about how you know one of your um, suggestions is to simplify. But at the same time, we're dealing, as Lisa said, with really, or you said it as well, really complex information. So how do you find those kind of bite-sized, simple um, stories or, or talking points? So I think there's a couple of ways you can get into this. Um, a lot of people on this call are from very different levels of understanding and communication. So I'm going to break it down a few different ways. Um, if you're really far into the science, that this is a, this is a whole different discussion, and we can get into that. But from the, the the real basic entry levels is, if you have questions about things, don't always feel like you have to come up to the level of what the scientist is saying because that means someone else who hasn't engaged in this will have those same questions. And so let me just explain that a little bit more. Once you can break down what they're saying with the data or with the trend or whatever, that's how you can process that messaging going forward. That's what I mean by simplifying. When we're in those circles of scientists and reading the research reports, it gets really geeky and you can have a different level of conversation with the data and the numbers. But there's a glazed overlook that I tried to bring in. If you're talking to someone and you see they're tuned out, you lost them. 
right? So you've gone too far with your balance of numbers and science, and you're going to want to pull it back. So it, this is where the art comes in with the science of communication. And it depends on what level of conversation that person knows in this topic and what level you know of how far you want to go with that. So that would kind of take me to the next um, question, just in terms of what do you think a reasonable expectation is for, a, you know, when you initiate a climate conversation? Lisa, you, you really got us going here from the beginning, talking about, you know, climate stories and personalizing. So what would you consider, you know, to be a, a, good, ex, uh, a, a good outcome from a conversation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think it really depends on where the individual is that you're talking with and also the context. <laughs> so if you have to teach a class and you need to get students to a certain level of understanding, obviously that's pretty obvious your learning outcomes. But you know, if you're if you're engaging with somebody who's curious, who maybe hasn't quite thought about it, who feels like the science is overwhelming to them, um, then I think just sort of having them cue into the things that are going on around them and reflecting on what might be different. So some of the examples that Anthony gave were great with regard to the marine layer. Uh, if you're local here to um, Santa Barbara or even what's going on in Texas, why is it that this is something that we've never seen before and then why are we struggling with it? Um, and if you can find maybe something that you feel comfortable as a starting point <clears throat> and just getting somebody to not shut down. I'd say if you can get someone to not immediately go into the political mindset, into the um, queuing into the sort of schema or whatever they have that's sort of helping them believe that it's not happening, avoiding that and keeping them open-minded and curious and asking questions, I'd say that's a good first step. Yeah, you don't need to do it all. <laughs> yeah, and again, a lot of the questions that we're seeing come in have to do with how do you take such a big, complex, multifaceted, um, uh, you know, issue that really gets into so many different overlapping areas of science and then and make that tangible for folks. So this question may be for Anthony and uh, and or Bernadette and there are a number of questions al along this about teasing out the, um, the storyline using weather and how to tease that out for a broader um, you know for broader um, stories around climate. So this last question from um, well, one of the last questions from Matt Zafino, um, to dovetail on Anthony's point, the question I get most is, is this weather event caused by climate change? I'd love to see graphics on attribution studies if available so we can tell viewers wh what contribution climate change made to a specific event. Either of you wanna take that one? I'll, I'll start, I, Bert, we know Matt, so. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so just so everybody <laughs> so knows, Matt's also a rock star Bernie, team I was gonna respond. <laughs> I, I will say this, a lot of, I mean, a lot of cutting edge science is going on right now. And right now they are working on attribution science. Someone I saw also asked about like the bending of the jet stream and this, that it, you're getting these, this Arctic blast, the, mm -hmm. uh, this, the, the polar jet is, is sinking, is sinking all the way down the polar vortex. Is that climate change? And those studies are going on right now. And, and for me, listen, in my job, you have to be honest. You, you can't go out on a limb and say yes when the science doesn't support you yet. So you want to go with the science, but the science is being done right now. And so there's a lot of really good things with attribution science that's happening right now. And you can share those for me, at least in my job, you share what you know right now. You share the studies. And, and these are two cutting edge uh, topics with the jet stream and then also with attribution that's happening right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll jump into that a little more. So for the, the people who really get geeky about science, this is fun because we're watching science happen right in front of us. And it, it, it's fascinating. For those who don't know what attribution science is, I want to bring you along in this conversation and not lose you. It's this new advancement where we can dissect an individual extreme event and see the role that climate change played in the likelihood of that event happening. Now, this doesn't mean that it caused that event. And this is where the science gets caught up a little bit. Mm -hmm. The event was gonna happen, right? But did climate change make it worse? Did it make it more frequent? Did it make, if it's rainfall, did it produce more rain with that event? Uh, so that's the way that attribution science is investigating almost these different events. And it's gotten so advanced that 
you can do this in really quick time frames now after an event happens. Um, so it, it's right on that fringe of advancing to a whole different level of, of, of fascination. We have a lot more confidence in heat events. Almost always a heat event is made more likely because of climate change. There's a lot of connection to extreme rainfall events, not always, but there's, there is a, there's a strong tie to that. It starts to get a little more complicated with certain tropical systems, with certain setups for wildfire events. You know, we're still advancing that science. So that's, that's what Anthony's talking about a little bit. And that's what Matt's asking is people want to know because the science has gotten to that point, they want to know it for every event, but we're not quite at the computer capacity to turn every event quite yet. So Stay tuned, we're getting there, it, it is advancing. And then the other piece of that is the changing jet stream. And this is, this, this is similar, but somewhat different because that really sets up our weather pattern. And that science isn't quite as advanced as attribution science. There's, a, there's been a national, for those who wanna get super geeky, there's a whole national academy study done on attribution science that you can see how far it's come. And with the changing jet stream, there's a lot of active research and it's getting to a point that we, we know something's happening, but there's still some questions on exactly what, but what, what's driving that research is that our poles are warming about twice the rate that the tropics are warming. Mm -hmm. And when you think about a jet stream, it's really powered along by the difference in temperature between the pole and the tropics. And when you start to lose the difference in that temperature, it slows down those winds a little bit, sort of like a river. When you see a river getting slower, it starts to meander and take different paths. That's what happens with our jet stream. And so when you get stuck in one of those patterns where there's a huge dip, what that does is allows even colder air to come down, stay in place for longer. On the reverse side, if you're in a big, what we call a ridge, a big bump in that jet stream, it pumps up even more heat and it gets it locked in place and it worsens our air quality and all of that builds upon itself. So there's a lot of research and evidence that something is happening, but we're still figuring out what is really where we are. Very good. Thank you. Okay, there are a number of questions just in terms of about climate centers, uh, centrals. Um, the tools and how to access them and who they're available to. And I'm going to ask Anne or Bernadette to um, handle those questions in writing offline because I want to make sure that those get answered. But I do, I'm going to come back to the storytelling. Lisa, if you could come back and join us, I want to come back to the storytelling question. And really, and this one's kind of out of left field because we, we've been talking mostly about how to communicate with adults because the adults are who watched the news. But one of the questions is about um, how to, you know, address the issue with elementary school aged children. And the question is, my grandson is aware of the climate crisis and I wanna make sure I'm communicating with him in an age appropriate way about this issue. Any thoughts? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's interesting because I just wrapped up another research project with NOVA this past spring where we were looking at um, 11 to 13 year olds and then 18 to 25 year olds and their perceptions of climate and also polar science in particular. But um, the one main difference we found between the younger audiences, 11 to 13 and the older, was that they actually had something that we, we called, it was like almost like a sense of dread. So whenever they saw um, videos about the amount of emissions or even how we can look at ice cores and understand that the CO2 levels have changed and um, it, you know different polar science with regard to fossilized tree remains and whatever it was, it always came back to the point of like, well, what are we gonna do? This just means that we're in like a really dire situation. So I just want to um, acknowledge that it's a very delicate age. Mm. And so uh, the main thing that we found was that it was helpful to always pair it with like a solution, but not always to put it on them. So um, again, I know that's not the story arc per se that you would use, but just a reminder that if you do mention it, that there are there is science underway, that there are options, that there are things that you can do um, and you can become a part of the solution. So that's sort of a, a broad response. I don't know if that got exactly at the question, but um, mm -hmm. solutions are key. Very good. Anybody have anything they want to add to that question? I think we're we're about coming up to our to end of our time. We've got a couple more things we want to touch on. 
I'll add another resource there too, um, mm -hmm. ACE, A-C-E. It's a great organization that is focused on climate education. Now, some of the resources are geared a little more toward high school and middle school, but they have a great network uh, of how to engage in this. What are the most effective ways and other people who are doing it. And so kids can connect with other kids who are engaged in this. There's another boot camp too for kids who are interested in this. It's called the Wild Center. It's in upstate New York and they do these deep dives for kids that, that want to learn more and do more with climate change. Excellent. Thank you, Bernadette. I knew you would be the woman to ask, so appreciate it. Well, I just really want to thank, again, Lisa, Bernadette, and Anthony for a really provocative um, evening and to all of you for coming out and, in, and engaging it, um, with us at this time. Um, it's funny, when I was growing up, there was a, uh, my grandpa used to make this saying, have a saying that um, is a little tongue in cheek, but you know, everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. And here we are really in a totally different era. And I know I'm going to get it for the difference between climate and weather. But I, anyway, we're I'm really appreciating the attention that people are, are putting on this topic and the level of expertise that you all are bringing in. Um, so with that, I want to share a couple of things um, about the organizations that presented tonight. So if we could go to those slides, please. Um, we've got a couple, we've got some upcoming events. Um, Climate Central is hosting a climate and health workshop tentatively scheduled for March 18th. The main speaker will be Howard Frumkin, Professor Emeritus of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences at the University of Washington School of Public Health. So to find out more, contact Ann Hayes at Climate Central. And you can um, uh, put that in the chat or, and, and Anne will put her email address in the chat. Um, our other partner tonight, uh, the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History is, I wanna let you know about some upcoming events with them. They're offering virtual camps and classes and you can see their website in the chat to learn more. The museum is open outdoors with limited capacity and advanced reservations are required. Their very popular discovered dinosaurs in the wild exhibit is back. So that's fun. And then the Community Environmental Council has a, a number of events coming up um, really focused this month on climate change. Um, we're starting uh, with the Climate Resilience Roundtable next Friday, an affordable electric vehicle clinic on March 23rd. And then we're supporting the Cowdings Climate Action Plan Workshop on March 25th. And please save the date for our virtual Earth Day Festival, which will be three days, April 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. And that um, website is in the chat. We've also done a couple of events on climate um, already, and they are on our website, you know, links to the YouTube um, recordings if you missed those. I also would be remiss if I didn't just brag about ourselves for a moment. CEC was recognized as a California nonprofit of the year and a city of Santa Barbara climate hero for our work to advance rapid and equitable solutions to the climate crisis. We work across Santa Barbara, Ventura and San Luis Obispo counties with um, as really ambitious goals around zero carbon, drawdown of ex excess carbon and protection against the impacts of climate change. So you can see our website in the chat as well. With that, I really want to thank the team that came together here. I also want to thank um, Michael Smith, who introduced us to um, Climate Central. Thank you to Luke Swetlin, Stephanie Coleman, and everyone at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History, Ann Hayes, Bernadette woods Plackey, and everyone at Climate Central, and Anthony Yenez from NBC Universal, and of course, my team at the Community Environmental Council, Kathy King and Iris Kelly. And again, thanks to all of you for coming. We will send you an email with a link to the recording of this, as well as all the resources that we discussed tonight. So please feel free to share those with friends. And who knows, it may be a really great way to start a conversation about climate change with people that you know. So I think it, um, it notable that the date today is March 4th. So with that, March 4th, everyone, and have a great evening.